Flashback to the year 2002. We just recently finished playing the survival horror masterpiece Resident Evil 1 Remake. Before that, the likes of Resident Evil 2, 3, and Code Veronica were also released, following the same gameplay loops with generally each game improving upon the last. All of these games used the established elements at the time of two playable characters, item boxes, and limited saves. Even to this day, modern RE titles still contain these features despite changes to gameplay style or camera perspectives. Now you're looking forward to playing Capcom's next title, Resident Evil Zero, a prequel going all the way back to the events of the first game, taking place just one day before. Looking extremely similar to Resident Evil 1 Remake, one might expect that Zero would play the same. But that's just not the case. A lot of people hail the original Resident Evil 4 as the first main game to change the formula and pave the way for future titles. It might even be your favorite game in the series. In reality, Resident Evil Zero was the first mainline title to bring major changes. While not to the extent that RE4 would, RE0 made changes to the established formula at the time, leading to some interesting or frustrating gameplay depending on how you look at it. Changes that will either have you enjoying the game as a nice break from the typical Resident Evil blueprint, or have you condemning it as one of the worst games in the series to the point of not even finishing it. So grab a snack and a drink because it's time to talk about In order to properly talk about Resident Evil Zero, I have to take you all the way back to the year 1998 and the Nintendo 64. At the time, Yoshiki Okamoto, who was supervising development of Resident Evil 2 for the PlayStation, was a big fan of Nintendo and believed that Capcom should release their games on all available consoles, which included Nintendo's flagship console, the N64. Nintendo were just beginning to open up to the idea of including more mature games on their console, making it the perfect time to bring Resident Evil to Nintendo. Hesitant to create a brand new game for a brand new audience on the N64, Okamoto suggested instead to go with a port of Resident Evil 2, which by then was almost complete for the PlayStation. If this port went well, it would justify future Nintendo titles. Resident Evil 2 would then go on to perform the miracle of fitting on the N64 cartridge, which was very limiting space-wise when it came to fitting things like CG cutscenes, voice acting, and an extensive soundtrack. Basically, the team fit two PlayStation discs worth of content onto a single N64 cartridge while still making a decent version, unlike some other RE2 ports. With this successfully accomplished, the team would then set their sights on another Resident Evil title for the N64. Capcom needed to strike a balance between creating a brand new title exclusive to the N64, while at the same time not excluding PlayStation owners from a major part of the story. Therefore, the team decided to go with a prequel to the original Resident Evil, with the intention of providing background context to the mansion incident through playing as Star's Bravo team member, Rebecca Chambers. This way, Nintendo owners who are new to the franchise could hop in and play the game without having to worry about the other games, while fans already familiar with the series could find plenty of connections to the first game. This N64 exclusive title would be called Resident Evil Zero. And now with some familiarity of the cartridge format, the team would start to use some of its features to their advantage. I'm not a tech based channel, so I'm not going to bore you with the specifics, but the N64 and its cartridges were able to load data faster than the discs of the PlayStation. So the team decided to use the opportunity to make some changes. Changes like having two playable protagonists together at the same time. The concept was to create a Resident Evil that could be stored on a cartridge. The big point is that at the time, PlayStation was the main platform. But if you have two characters and switch between them, you have to load each time you switch. But if you use Nintendo 64, there's no need for loading because of the cartridge. Another change 
the team would go for using the unique features of the cartridge would be having the player be able to drop and pick up items in any room at any time during the playthrough, thus causing the team to remove the need for the item boxes. A change that would prove contentious among fans, but we'll talk about that more in a bit. Development would continue into 1999, and by this point, the scenario was mostly complete along with the voiceovers for Billy and Rebecca. Come next year, Capcom would officially show off the game at the Tokyo Game Show, marking the first and only time this prototype footage would be officially shown to the public until 16 years later. The footage demoed the train section which was comparable to the quality of Resident Evil 2 on the PS1. Reception to the demo was great, and the game seemed to have plenty of promise, but unfortunately, there was one problem that was creeping up on Capcom, time. See, the market was starting to change. Earlier that year, the PlayStation 2 released and Nintendo's GameCube was on its way to being released soon as well. By the time Resident Evil Zero was planned to be completed, the GameCube would already be released. Making a game for a platform that wouldn't be supported soon wasn't really the smartest move for Capcom, especially given the game was supposed to be exclusive to Nintendo. Halting development for the N64 version, the team shifted over to the GameCube, looking toward the future. It was becoming impossible to fit everything on a cartridge. We consulted Nintendo frequently, but we decided any ideas to fit the game on a cartridge format wouldn't be economically viable. The GameCube was announced shortly thereafter, and then we decided to resume development. Now that you've got some information on how RE0 came to be, let's look at those changes, starting off with the most obvious one. You have an AI partner with you for most of the game, but unlike future titles like Resident Evil 5 and 6, you can switch to control them at any time, which is how you'll solve various puzzles that the game throws at you. These usually involve one character moving an object or being on a lift somewhere while the other character activates a switch of some kind. Nothing too complicated. But now that you've got a partner with you, that means double the firepower. So it's going to be a little bit confusing when I say this is one of the harder games in the series. The team designed the rooms and enemies around having two characters, so most of the time you'll be in cramped rooms with enemies coming from multiple angles. You'll have to choose between focusing your firepower on one enemy to quickly take them out, or splitting your focus and hoping you and the AI can each take out your foe. The team even made it so that this would be the first game where you can be grabbed by multiple zombies at the same time, something we would see return in the RE2 remake. This leads to some terrifying encounters while exploring a training facility for items and a way out of the nightmare. Speaking of items, one of the biggest complaints about this game is the lack of an item box. That thing where you store your strong weapons for later, your excess healing and important items, yeah, that's gone, and each character only has 6 inventory spaces, making for a total of 12. What makes this even worse is the fact that this is the only classic style Resident Evil game where your heavy weapons such as the shotgun or grenade launcher take up 2 slots instead of 1, meaning if you want both Rebecca and Billy to carry their handgun and a heavy weapon, you've already cut your inventory space in half. And then you've got to factor in your key items, your healing, your ammo. You'll find your inventory will be full the majority of the time you're playing the game. So what are you supposed to do with all these items? Drop them on the floor? Uh, yeah, literally anything you don't want in your inventory at the moment, you just drop on the floor. The floor is your item box, which is kind of convenient and a major annoyance. On the upside, anytime you come across a key item, Instead of having to backtrack all the way to a safe room to dump your inventory like in a classic Resident Evil, you could just choose to drop something on the floor in exchange for what you need. On the downside, whatever you drop, if you want it later, you'll have to go back to that exact spot for it. Meaning if you drop an item in a side room your first hour into the game and for whatever reason you want that item back 5 hours later in your playthrough, I hope you like backtracking. During my first playthrough, I found myself using the main hall as sort of an item box whenever my inventory became full, meaning I had to do a lot of small backtracking, but I never really had to worry about my items. 
You don't have to do it this way as the map conveniently tracks your items for you so you'll always know where they are but I just like to play in that particular way. At a certain point during the game, you leave the mansion for a new main area to explore, which led me to basically turning Billy and Rebecca into pack mules, transporting all of our items to the new area, which is a bit tedious and not everyone is going to be down for this, as that's the kind of thing that you might do if you were playing on a harder difficulty. And I can see the average person getting really annoyed at this upon discovering they might have to backtrack to grab their strong weapons or their key items. While we're talking about backtracking, it would be a shame if I didn't mention this bad boy. The hookshot is a two space key item that you'll find on the train section of the game, use and probably drop on the floor and forget about once you explore the training facility area. Around halfway through the game, you'll have to use it again. And on a first playthrough, when you're not expected to know this, it turns into more backtracking. While I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing, it can sort of artificially increase the difficulty, especially during this backtracking. After you make it further in through the game, the training facility will be repopulated with new enemies in certain areas, meaning your backtracking can turn lethal too. The other frustrating thing is the health differences between Rebecca and Billy. In a Rebecca-centric game, you'd mostly want to control her, right? Well, that actually makes the game about 20 times harder. I'm not even joking. Sometimes just one zombie grab can cause Rebecca to go into caution. She can only take such a small amount of damage compared to Billy, who can sometimes tank up to three zombie grabs before even dipping into caution. And once you figure this out, there's pretty much no reason to have Rebecca at the front exploring unless you want an additional challenge. The other major difference between them is that only Rebecca can mix herbs because for whatever reason, Billy can't science. Oh, and Rebecca is way better at throwing Molotovs. I mean, look at this. Billy, please. It's so bad I pretty much never use these to kill enemies. Now usually, when people hear about all these changes, especially when compared to the more traditional style of Resident Evil 1 Remake, they usually shy away from the game or never end up finishing the game. But I actually enjoy some of them. The whole lack of an item box reminds me of one of the optional modes in Resident Evil 1 Remake. I keep bringing up 1 Remake because in my eyes, the two are pretty parallel to each other. One of them is hailed as one of the greatest remakes of all time, and the other is just kind of there, even though they're pretty similar to each other. Now on to the point I was making. One Remake has this mode called Real Survival. In Real Survival mode, you still have all the item boxes, but only now, they're disconnected. So if you put your healing and shotgun into one item box in the mansion, then you make your way to a completely different item box, that healing and shotgun won't be in there. Instead, the items will still be in the previous box you left them in. That's pretty much Resident Evil Zero. Remember when I said the floor is your item box? Wherever you leave that item, it's stuck until you go back to get it. Now, Resi 1 introduces you to this mode after you beat the game. So you've already got some of that previous knowledge to mitigate some frustration you might face. Also, it's just an optional mode, so you don't have to do it. Resident Evil Zero takes off the training gloves and immediately has you starting on this type of difficulty, which is like a sort of barrier to entry, especially if you've never played RE1's real survival mode. But just like most games, once you adjust to the mechanics, it's not that bad. And definitely the least egregious thing that RE0 does gameplay wise. But it's often the thing that you hear people complain about the most, even though it's a slight attempt at changing the established formula so things don't become stale. When you think about it, Resident Evil games are kind of defined by their enemies. Resident Evil 1 had the original zombies, Resident Evil 2 had liquors and the G monsters, Resident Evil 3 had Nemesis, and so on. Being confined to being a prequel, the enemy variety is a bit limited and this holds RE0 back unfortunately. You'll see why in a bit. So let's talk about those enemies. Starting us off, we've got, well, zombies. There's nothing really special about them in this game, and that's okay. It makes sense for a prequel. Though the team did have some ideas during development that would have made them stand out. But because of either the move to the GameCube or some other unknown reasons, these didn't go through. 
we looked into making running zombies, which were like precursors to RE Remake's Crimson Heads, and even thought about letting players counterattack while they're being bit. In a different timeline, we'd be singing praises about RE Zero having running zombies and defense weapons because of, instead of these ideas making it into Zero, they were instead implemented into RE1 Remake. Leechmen make their first and only appearance in this game. They're the culmination of multiple T-virus infected leeches taking on a human aid form. These tie with Eliminators, the next enemy I'll talk about, for the most annoying enemies in the entire game. Not only do they have a weird uncanny design, but their attacks are uncanny too. Their arms extend outwards like a whip and 9 out of 10 times, this feels pretty impossible to dodge. And that's due to a combination of the attack being a bit ridiculous, as well as the fact that pretty much every time you encounter one of these enemies, it's in a hallway. That means limited space to try to outmaneuver the attack like you would a zombie. Fighting against them is another story as well. Unlike every other non-boss enemy in the game, with the exception of the lurker, these enemies don't get hit stun from the shotgun. Your best bet is to either use a Molotov or, better yet, fire rounds with the grenade launcher so you don't have to get close. On subsequent playthroughs, when you know what you're doing, you can kind of avoid the hallways and rooms they'll be in until you absolutely need to go there, and making sure you never have to backtrack there again. Because when you first enter a room with the leechmen, they start out by transforming. During this transformation, you can run by them without worry of being hit. And if you're quick enough, you can even keep them from transforming by leaving the room before they complete. But like I said, that's after multiple playthroughs once you know what you're doing. Oh, and to top it off, every time you encounter one of the leechmen, this plays. Yep. Every time you enter a room with one of them in it, as long as it's alive. <sighs> Eliminators are just as annoying, but for different reasons. They're T-virus infected monkeys and oh boy. You'll normally encounter them in packs, and their speed and ability to leap at you makes them pretty dangerous to deal with, leading to you getting overwhelmed pretty fast. They have this very annoying claw attack that can pretty much stunlock you, and the Eliminators can attack before your character even has a chance to attack back, leading to either wasting heals or just straight up dying. I found the best solution to dealing with them is to find the nearest corner, back yourself up into it with a shotgun, and blast them as soon as any come on screen. While writing this section for the video, I almost forgot about these enemies, the, the lurkers. Giant frogs, basically. They have the ability to insta-kill you. If you're caught by their tongue, without your partner, you're done for. This sounds like a huge deal, but for whatever reason, there are only maybe four of these in the entire game. In my first playthrough, I'm pretty sure I didn't even run into them at all, as they aren't even guaranteed to pop up. There's nothing wrong with these enemies at all, I just find it such a weird decision that you could play through the entire game and only run into maybe one of these enemies or possibly none at all. Plague crawlers are just giant bugs. I mean, there's not much more to say about them. Plague crawlers were put in the game instead of these creatures referred to as D-A-L-I, this weird giant leech slug thing that's quite frankly more terrifying than anything that made it into the final game. The same goes for the Spider-Man enemies. They were rejected in place of normal giant spiders. When asked about these enemies, director Koji Oda stated that they were too much of a departure from traditional Resident Evil monsters. Oh, if only they could have looked into the future at the time for the likes of the mold monsters and essentially werewolves. I think this would have helped RE0 stand out a bit more with these unique monsters, which could have been explained away by Marcus going mad with experimentation before his untimely demise. Instead, we have generic monsters, and this even extends to the bosses, which I haven't mentioned up until now because besides the end bosses, they aren't really too memorable. Your options are a giant scorpion, a giant centipede, and can you guess the last one? A giant bat. Now this makes sense story wise as the virus would have been tested on animals before humans, but gameplay wise it's already been done before. Resident Evil 1 has Yawn, the giant snake, Plant 42 and so on. I would have loved to have at the very least the bosses of Resident Evil 0 be more out there and unhinged. Coming from the mind of a mad scientist Marcus who was willing to push the bounds of his research no matter how horrific the end result would turn out. To me, 
music is a pretty important part of the horror experience. It can either take an already terrifying scene and elevate it to even higher heights, or it can distract you so much that you're completely taken out of the experience. Resident Evil Zero does both. We'll cover the music by each section of the game, starting with the train, which is completely quiet except for the sounds of zombies and the tracks. But this isn't actually a complaint. I think it's quite fitting for the start of the game when you're just getting your bearings. During the train section, you have to engage with a puzzle and timer, and this plays. It does a very good job at creating a worrying sense of urgency. Moving on to the training facility. This entire place has this kind of ambient horror track and I really like it. I just wish there was a bit more variety. Different rooms having their own themes. In Resident Evil 1 Remake, there's this hallway that you go through near the start of the game that plays this theme. And it always stands out to me because this hallway is very dangerous and whenever I enter it and this theme plays, it's like a switch flips on and it makes the room super memorable. Compare that to RE0, which has the same song for the majority of rooms, they all just kind of blend together. Inevitably, while you're exploring the facility, you'll come across the Leechman enemies and their theme that I showed earlier. I've never heard the flute played aggressively before, but there's a first time for everything. Once you finish the training facility, you'll come to this outside walkway and hear this beautifully dark piano theme. It's a shame that there's nothing really to do in this area as it's just here as a sort of transition until you get to the next area. But this theme is so good. Now we've made it to my favorite song from the track. This plays immediately in the next area after the walkway I just mentioned. This theme is everything I love. Dark, haunting, mysterious, the theme just makes the entire area feel unsafe and foreboding. Unfortunately, that really is the last areas to talk about when it comes to music. And the last areas after this doesn't really have music and instead go for this atmospheric noise or just none at all aside from the boss music. I really wish RE0 had more music because with the exception of when it's there, it's really good. But unfortunately, there's only a couple instances of that. Now that we've covered the mechanics and whatnot, we're gonna get into spoiler territory. I'm gonna talk about the story now in a bit of detail, so if you're looking forward to playing it yourself, skip to the timestamp above. Being a prequel, Resident Evil Zero starts one day before the events of Resident Evil 1. The first scene we're introduced to is a train owned by the pharmaceutical company Umbrella, the big baddies of the series. The Ecliptic Express comes under attack from a swarm of leeches. As the passengers and crew are attacked, a mysterious young man watches from a hillside. While this is going on, opera is happening in the background as music. I always used to think that this was just background music, but actually, the mysterious man is singing opera to control the leeches. Yeah, this had me doing a deep dive. If leeches had ears and how they communicate, it was a whole... I, I, it was a whole night. Anyways, two hours later, the Bravo team of the Special Tactics and Rescue Service, STARS, is sent to investigate a series of cannibalistic murders in the Arkway Mountains outside of Raccoon City. On the way to the scene, its helicopter has an engine failure and crash lands in a forest. Searching the area, the team find a wreckage of a prison transport that was scheduled to transport former Marine Billy Cohen for execution for the act of killing 23 people. And they immediately start searching for him just kind of forgetting about the murders that they were investigating, and also deciding to make the classic horror decision of splitting up. Rebecca comes across the train, now motionless. Stepping on the train alone, she begins to investigate the scene, only to find the passengers and crew transformed into zombies. Also, can we talk about how when they split up, they just let the rookie go by herself? Come on, guys. As she explores the train, she runs into Billy, and after a close encounter with some leeches, the two decide to work together despite Billy's supposed crimes. The pair notices the mysterious young man moments before the train suddenly begins moving again. Unbeknownst to the pair, two soldiers from Umbrella, on orders from Albert Wesker and William Birkin, attempt to take control of the train and destroy it. 
but are killed by leeches before they can complete their mission. As the train speeds out of control, Rebecca and Billy apply the brakes and avert its course towards an abandoned training facility for future executives of Umbrella. They discover that the former director of the facility and one of Umbrella's founders, Dr. James Marcus, was responsible for discovering the progenitor virus in the 1960s and decided to examine its potential as a biological weapon. He combined it with leech DNA to develop the T-virus that causes rapid mutations in living organisms and thus transforms humans and animals into zombies and monsters. As the pair continue to explore the facility, Wesker decides to leave Umbrella and join its rival company, setting the events of Resident Evil 1 in motion. William Birkin refuses his offer to join him, instead opting to complete his research on the G-virus, which would lead to Resident Evil 2. Around the same time, Billy and Rebecca have a heart-to-heart -heart where Billy explains that his commanding officer at the time was the one who committed the slaughter and when Billy refused to take part, he pinned it on him. Later, the two become separated and Rebecca runs into her captain Enrico Marini who will meet up at an old mansion that they found but allows her to stay behind to find Billy, alone by the way. And that's the last time that any of Bravo team is ever mentioned. After exploring for a bit, Rebecca rescues Billy and they continue searching for a way out of the nightmare. Eventually, Rebecca and Billy catch up with the leech controlling man who happens to be Marcus's final experiment, the Queen Leech. The experiment begins to explain that in 1988, Marcus was assassinated by Wesker and Birkin on the orders of Umbrella's other co-founder, Oswald E. Spencer, who sought his research. After his corpse was dumped, the Queen Leech entered his body and reanimated it gaining his memories and the ability to shapeshift. Thus, believing itself to be the resurrected Marcus and orchestrating the T-virus outbreak in the facility and on the train as a means of revenge against Umbrella. While fighting, they discover that the Queen Leech's weakness is sunlight, and they use that to kill it, treating us to this amazing line. Finally escaping to the outside, Rebecca notices the mansion that Enrico mentioned and prepares to head for it. Before she does, she assures Billy that her police report will list him as another casualty of the incident. Thanking her for his freedom, Billy departs into the forests as Rebecca heads toward the mansion to seek out the whereabouts of her fellow Bravo team members, leading straight into the events of Resident Evil 1. Now, in the grand scheme of things, the story of Resident Evil Zero really doesn't do anything for the overall story of the series. We find out about one of the founders of Umbrella, got a little bit more backstory on Wesker and Birkin, and got to see what happened to the Bravo team before Resident Evil 1. But therein lies the problem. Once you're past the first 10 minutes of the game, you really never hear about the Bravo team ever again besides one cutscene with Enrico later in the game. It's really just disheartening as the Bravo team is one of the reasons that this game exists and they're just forgotten about. Once past the train, you most likely won't even remember that Rebecca came to the forest with a squad until Enrico shows up again because she never mentions them. I totally get the idea of not wanting to focus on them because of the fact that fans of RE1 already know how Bravo team members die. But even just some back and forth between the members would have gone a long way. Hell, the majority of them aren't even voiced in this game. The opening cutscene is about all we see of them, and I'm supposed to expect that these people are a squad that care and back each other up? Yeah, okay. During the train section near the end, you're given the choice of using either Rebecca or Billy, while the other stays behind for a puzzle. If you choose Rebecca, you'll get this scene where Rebecca encounters Edward, one of her fellow team members, now zombified, and he's directly blocking your path. If you go there with Billy, you get nothing because, well, Billy would have no idea who this is. This isn't really possible with the other team members as they all die in the mansion in Resident Evil 1, but 
maybe Rebecca running into them or at least communicating by radio. Rebecca was supposed to be the rookie of the team, so possibly seeing the other members acting as older brothers to her, suggesting they meet up at the Spencer Mansion maybe. Look, I'm not a script writer for games or anything, but it just feels like somewhere along the way, Bravo team got completely forgotten about. The story also creates some inconsistencies with RE1, a major one being how Rebecca goes through the entirety of the game, even facing off against a tyrant by herself. But when you meet her in RE1 as Chris, you would never know she's already faced off against the worst of the worst. She's just as confused about the situation as the rest of the cast. Resident Evil has never been a masterclass at storytelling or anything, but it's hard to ignore this kind of inconsistency, especially when the games were released only 8 months apart. It's like the dev teams didn't even talk to each other when making the stories, which is so interesting when seeing that during development, RE0 has ideas that were ultimately implemented into a Resi 1 remake. So I just gotta ask, what happened there? Now, you've been here listening to me ramble on about Resident Evil Zero and what I think about it, but it's always good to hear other people's opinions. So I went to ask the lovely people at Reddit their thoughts on RE0, and I asked them to list one thing they enjoy about the game and one thing they dislike. This is what some of them had to say. I actually love almost everything about this game. I love playing as Rebecca. She's my favorite RE character. I like Billy. The soundtrack is great and I love the atmosphere. I like the lack of an item box and control of two characters. It makes it a challenging experience and a unique one in the franchise. I love having to conserve ammo and running into a boss and realizing, oh shit, I don't have enough ammo. It's a feeling that's rare to have in the modern titles. My biggest gripe with the game is how little they did with the concept. It's meant to be a precursor to RE1 and set it up but it hardly does that and it tells a largely unrelated story. I loved playing as both characters together. There's no question as which events or whose playthrough is the true story because we had them both so we know where everyone was and when. I also really liked having someone there, even an AI, when I was going through creepy areas. Like Rebecca would be okay because she had backup. Like most people, I hated the inventory item box situation. We played too many games with the item boxes and understood how it worked, so suddenly losing it was weird. Lots of ground to cover, small personal inventory, and no home base to stash stuff was frustrating. Combined with how often we had to go fetch the stupid hookshot, instead of just hitting the nearest save room for the box you had to figure out where you left it. Annoying. I liked Rebecca. Hated everything else. I know Ari has never really been story heavy with character interactions, but I would have liked to have gotten to spend some time with the Bravo team. Enrico got done dirty. Love how good all of the backgrounds look. Definitely the best looking classic game if it is an RE1 remake. The train is also a pretty interesting kind of location for an RE game, and I do like the look of a lot of the other rooms like the observatory. Really hate the lack of item boxes and how clunky item management becomes, despite having 12 slots between two people and the ability to drop items wherever you want. Just makes the game feel more tedious overall. Those are just some of the comments people left behind. If you want to browse the full thread, I'll leave a link to it down below in the description. Now, it may seem like I've been a bit harsh on Resident Evil Zero throughout this video, but I actually enjoyed my time with the game, despite some of the issues. I enjoyed it so much that I went ahead and got all the achievements, some of which are pretty tedious. Like many other Resident Evil games, it faced some issues during development, including switching consoles and dealing with the fact that it is a prequel. The purpose of the game's inception was for two reasons. To create a Resident Evil title exclusive to a Nintendo console, which was accomplished. The game did successfully come out on the GameCube before being re-released on the Wii and the HD versions being made for PCs and the 8th generation consoles. The other reason was to expand upon the lore of the mansion incident, giving players more insight into the Umbrella Corporation through the eyes of Rebecca and the Bravo team. As we know though, Zero doesn't really do a good job in this aspect and you can ultimately just skip it as it's not important to the larger story and I hate having to say that. When people ask me where they should start when getting into Resident Evil, I always recommend the RE1 remake. And then I have to asterisk that if you enjoyed that, maybe then give RE0 a try. 
The game has its issues, but it's by no means a bad game. It's just not a friendly game. The gameplay style is essentially the same as RE1 Remake, but slight changes like no item boxes, Rebecca's lower health, and the constant inventory management, and that deadly enemies can easily turn someone away from the game. Had Resident Evil Zero been released earlier, I think it would have been more favorably looked at in the eyes of some fans. Instead, it would be the last mainline game after a series of titles all sticking to the same formula and coming out only 8 months after Resident Evil 1 Remake, which would arguably perfect that formula. After Zero, the next number title would be Resident Evil 4 and that game flipped the franchise on its head. Resident Evil Zero is stuck in between this awkward stage of trying to add some different features and change things up, but not to the major extent that Resi 4 would. The whole game is essentially an arranged mode of classic Resident Evil, and I don't think you can really blame the devs for trying something a bit different. The formula had already been established, and even though I look back fondly on that era of games at the time, the formula could be considered getting a bit stale. Enter RE0, attempting some different gameplay ideas. And whatever you think of the changes, you have to give the team credit for trying something different while developing for completely new hardware to them. I mean, take a look at Resident Evil 4, many people's favorite in the series. It doesn't have too many elements of classic RE and plays completely different from the former games. Look at how many different revisions that game had to go through before getting it right. One of those revisions even became its own game. But that's a story for another time. Had the concept of RE0 been thought up of a little bit earlier, or maybe gone through some more revisions before release, Resi0 could have turned out great. And at the end of the day, while what we got is by no means a bad game, it falls short of some of the ideas and story threads that it set out to expand upon in the first place, leaving a game that wants to try something different and play it safe at the same time. Thank you for watching. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Alex Anil for their book, Itchy Tasty, An Unofficial History of Resident Evil. A lot of my research about the development of RE0 came directly from that. Make sure to go follow them on Twitter. I'm not calling it X. And make sure to go buy their book for deep info on Resident Evil. Also, a big thanks to my friends for providing their voices for this project. They're all fellow creators. Links down below in the description. And. Thanks to you for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.